<clears throat> so we can uh, uh, start our today's event and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, even though we have a lot of uh, difficulties uh, in current days, we hope that uh, this will not <clears throat> distract us from academic thinking, from uh, research and also discussion and debates. Uh, uh, before we proceed, I just again give some uh, short background for this project. Uh, since March of this year, Center for Urban History initiated uh, several, uh, as we called them, archival projects, and we uh, understood, and still we are very aware of, about this, uh, that there is a need to archive what is happening around us, and we uh, archive uh, social media images, uh, oral testimonies, and uh, uh, one of the projects that we started was related to ego documents or uh, war diaries. And among these diaries uh, appeared a lot of dreams. Uh, maybe not a lot, but again, some dreams. And uh, when we had a discussion in the spring, what we are doing and what would be the future of all this, uh, there was in this team uh, uh, of uh, participants, Magdalena Zolkos, who is with us today. And then uh, we exchanged letters after the event. And uh, since that time, we're still in the contact. And in, uh, uh, she helped a lot to develop our archival project. And also, she helped a lot to, uh, to make it uh, possible and also to develop it into the future. Yes, uh, so the university where Magdalena works uh, helped uh, us with this project. And also uh, we decided that it would be good to give additional voices to collection of dreams or diaries or whatever, in general, ego documents uh, uh, in order to continue uh, this discussion. And uh, this way, uh, through Magdalena, we met uh, Dr. Wojciech of Charsky, uh, and we are very happy about this. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we heard about uh, Dr. Ovcharsky, but since we are kind of working with different uh, uh, spheres, and I would say even genres, uh, <laughs> we didn't have opportunity to have direct communication. And uh, today's uh, uh, presentation and then discussion uh, has a title, Dreams of the Prisoners of Auschwitz Concentration Camp. And Dr. Wojciech Obczarski uh, is not a specialist in Holocaust history or Jewish history, but he is, uh, uh, his background is literary studies. I will introduce him now. But uh, again, uh, <clears throat> I'm very happy that this is kind of uh, through dreams we can come to these combined or hybrid disciplines, which can uh, combine various perspectives and various focuses on uh, history uh, as well. So uh, uh, this, is my, this is my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor of Humanities, uh, Dr. Ovcharsky. He teaches literature and cultural studies at the University of Gdańsk in Poland. And uh, this uh, uh, cultural studies uh, uh, is taught at the Department of Languages. So uh, Dr. Ovcharsky is mainly uh, working with this tool, which we have uh, as language and literature as, as a product of language, yes. And then uh, at a certain point, uh, Dr. Ovcharsky introduced the research unit, uh, which uh, specialized in studying dreams and memory and imagination. So it's called the research unit for dream, memory, and imagination studies. And it still works at the University of Gdańsk. And uh, his interdisciplinary research interests include literary studies, dream studies, theater studies, cultural anthropology, and some other fields. Uh, Dr. Ovcharsky is a member of the International Association of the, for the Study of Dreams, the Cultural History of Dreams Network, the European Association of Holocaust Studies, the Polish Society for the Study of European Romanticism, and the Polish Writers Association. And uh, we are very happy to welcome you, uh, Dr. Ovcharsky, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Bogdan, for this introduction. Thank you all for being uh, here. I'm glad that dreams still interest, uh, interest people, and I will do my best 
uh, not to make you uh, fall asleep. And uh, I will uh, just uh, summarize some of my research uh, concerning the dreams of the Auschwitz uh, inmates. Uh, maybe I will start sharing my screen so it will be more uh, clear for everybody. Okay, one moment. This problem with slides. Hmm. Okay, okay, maybe maybe now. Just please forgive me my um, problems with the technical devices, but I hope. Is it visible now? Do, yes. do you see? My yes, 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 I see. Okay. And the change is, is, yes. is okay. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so again, dreams of the prisoners of Auschwitz uh, concentration camp. Uh, my research is based on testimonies that in uh, 1973 were sent to Polish psychiatrists, Polish doctors, who sent out a questionnaire about dreams. Uh, it was addressed to the former Auschwitz inmates. The, the main uh, researcher of this team, Stanisław Kłodziński, uh, he was also uh, in Auschwitz inmates himself. So he knew a lot of people, and uh, it was possible for him to send this question out to more than 500 people, uh, but uh, only 147 uh, people uh, responded. And it was uh, among them, there were uh, 101 men and uh, 47 women. Uh, this is a very interesting material. I found it in the Auschwitz Birkenau Museum. Mm, it contains some uh, 600 uh, pages of manuscripts. Uh, I uh, was able to identify uh, 504 dreams which concerned the life of the inmates uh, during the war in the camps and later after liberation, a lot of years uh, in, in freedom. And let me put on my glasses and, and sometimes I will read, sometimes I will just speak. Uh, the respondents were mostly Polish, uh, but uh, it is impossible to, to, to know how many of them were Jewish people. It is probable that there was a, a number of Jewish uh, respondents, but it is now impossible to, uh, to, to, to know for sure. So if, uh, whenever I use the term Holocaust, I, I use them in, it in a very broad uh, meaning, not, not the exact, uh, because the, the majority of, of the respondents uh, were not Jewish, but uh, Polish. Uh, and, and, you know, the Holocaust, the Holocaust is not always uh, is being uh, accepted as, as uh, a phenomenon concerning non-Jewish people. Uh, I was the most interested in the therapeutic effects of dreams, uh, because yes, to, to, to my recognition, more, more uh, dreams of the people had a thera therapeutic uh, potential, and also in the phenomenology of dream experience. And I will try to concentrate mostly on the, uh, the therapeutic dreams. And if, if the time uh, allows us, I, I will also mention something about the uh, phenomenology of, of experience. Uh, it is a paradox that uh, <clears throat> people, um, uh, while, while being in the camp, they had uh, generally positive dreams. Of course, they had nightmares, but, but most of the dreams uh, from the period of being imprisoned in the camp uh, they were uh, positive dreams, which which serve some uh, healing proper, uh, effects. And on the other hand, after liberation, most of the dreams were nightmares. Yes. So uh, we have a quotation from one one uh, respondent: "In the camp, I dreamt about being free. Nowadays, I dream about the camp." Uh, so let me concentrate now on uh, therapeutic dreams from the period uh, uh, of being imprisoned in the camp. Uh, my only criteria in ascertaining a healing impact of a dream were clear declarations from the dreamers themselves. I took into consideration only those dreams which uh, the dreamers openly described as helpful in one way or uh, another. And I found three general um, kinds of 
therapeutic dreams in the camp. There were caring dreams, so-called, freedom dreams, and metaphorical dreams. The caring dreams, uh, it was dreams when the dreamer uh, experiences care or support from his or her relative or some other figure, often supernatural. For example, uh, most, most often it was uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, sometimes it was just an angel, once it was Santa Teresa, and once Winston Churchill in the role of the uh, carer, you know, somebody who takes care of. of uh, in, and the mechanism of the therapeutic uh, effect of these dreams uh, was very simple. Uh, the caring figure simply announces to the dreamer that he or she would survive the camp. We have an example. I dreamt about the Holy Virgin in a white dress with a blue sash standing before darkness uh, that was uh, nearly black. She smiled and said, don't worry, you will survive this hell. This dream became such a strong part of my subconscious. I kept clinging to it as a last resort whenever times go down. And another example, I think an angel approached me, of course, in a dream. Uh, he wore a long white robe and gave me the Holy Communion and said, I am giving it to you for the path of life, not death, so you will live. I woke up feeling better, the crisis was over. I won the battle for my life and I was feeling much better. Mm -hmm. So you can see this is very simple mechanism. They don't, uh, the, the dreamers don't have to interpret these dreams. They, they don't uh, have some dream books or, or et cetera. They are just uh, assured that everything will be okay and they wake up with a good energy, with, with the uh, fight of, of a better future, even in the car. Uh, sometimes these dreams uh, were more complex, full of symbolic elements, something like that, for example. I dreamt about walking towards a narrow river filled with very murky water. Across the river, I saw my oldest, then deceased brother. Uh, he was walking towards me. We both went into the river at the same time. My legs got bogged down in the mood. The river was deep. When we met in the middle of the stream, my brother handed me a big, fairy fish. I was scared, screamed, Stahu, I can't carry it, I can't carry it. And he uh, calmly replied, you will carry it, you will carry it. When later I had a typhus fever, uh, his words gave me strength and hope that I would survive the uh, disease, and I did. So you can see that the helping effect of this dream does not result from the interpretation of symbolic elements, although they were here, but solely and directly from the consolic words of the dreamer's brother. The caring figures uh, should be regarded, of course, as manifestation of the manifestation of the dreamer's unconscious uh, thoughts. It is none other than the actual dreamer who speaks in the dream, convincing him or herself that he or she still has enough strength to survive the calm. Since in waking life, uh, this seems unbelievable to Auschwitz inmates. Their dreams must resort to, to external figures of authority, such as the Virgin Mary or their close relatives. Only in such a form can this message be accepted by the dreamer. Dreams constitute an excellent means of opening the dreamers to possibilities which they did not suspect to find within themselves. It may be assumed that this happens thanks to a mechanism which Ernest Hartmann calls hyperconnectedness. Uh, and uh, Ernest Hartmann was uh, one of the most important, most, most uh, known uh, dream theorists and dream researchers. And Ernest Hartmann uh, writes, uh, Dreaming is a spontaneous state of extremely free association in which our associations are not bound by the usual waking rules and self-criticism is greatly reduced. Uh, so I think that in the case of the inmates, the diminishing of self-criticism and enhancement of connectivity between ideas and products of imagination seem crucial for the therapeutic effect of caring dreams. Let's go now to the next um, kind of therapeutic dreams, which are freedom dreams. Uh, the, the inmates called them themselves. We had freedom dreams. We had uh, always uh, freedom dreams, or, or maybe not always, but often. 
Uh, these are dreams when the dreamer, uh, the dreamers find themselves back where they come from, at home or among their loved ones, or are simply aware of being outside the camp. And again, an example. Sometimes I had pleasant dreams about my life before the camp, my family or my school. In the morning, I woke up rested and happy. And another one, uh, for a time, sometimes lasting up to a couple of days, the dreams, the dreams about freedom helped us distance ourselves from the nightmare of camp life. They gave us an image to keep in our minds and look at, preserving it in your memory for as long as possible. So again, it is a very simple mechanism. After waking, the dreamers feel happy uh, because they were given the opportunity to meet with the uh, family or return to the places they love. Um, please uh, keep in mind that it is an actual, not symbolical help for the site. The very dream experience of being somewhere in freedom is what makes the dream helpful. The experience, not the knowledge that could be gained from it. Uh, so, so again, uh, it, this kind of dreams shouldn't be interpreted by anybody, by the dreamer or somebody else uh, to, to give them a positive energy and, and uh, positive uh, feelings. But it is important that not all freedom dreams were helpful and they often cause nostalgia and painful longing for the past. This is very interesting. Please uh, read uh, to this, uh, read this uh, example. I dreamt that I was home with my sisters and my parents. It was so real that when I heard the call, upper banks, get up, I didn't understand it. I returned to reality when they sounded the gong and cried like a babe. So this is a freedom dream, or dream about freedom, uh, which uh, causes uh, very bad feelings, yes? nostalgia, longing, uh, despair. And uh, so the question arises, why sometimes uh, this uh, kind of dreams, the freedom dreams, cause uh, positive uh, emotions and, and other times they cause uh, negative ones? Yes? Why those dreams were healing or harmful, uh, depending on the situation? Uh, I will now uh, mention my earlier research on uh, dreams of the um, nursing home re residents uh, in Poland, older people, uh, who also had very often dreams about the happy past. And in this situation, when they are, the people were old and, and uh, their future was uh, not, not fantastic for them, and they, they were aware that nothing, nothing good probably in, uh, happened in, in their lives, uh, having such dreams about being again at home, being again with their family, with, with their loved ones, these dreams always, in all cases, gave them a good uh, feeling and good energy. I, I didn't uh, meet anyone, any, any, any one person who would say um, that such dreams uh, was, was painful, nostalgia. Yes? Uh, so uh, I try to figure out uh, why why it is it is like that. That's, that's for some people these dreams can be good and healing, and for, for others they are they are uh, negative. Uh, my uh, hypothesis, based on the um, uh, reports of the Auschwitz inmates, is that uh, these dreams are healing for those who had no hope to survive and harmful for those who still had some hope. So uh, when an inmate was um, convinced that uh, he, he will uh, perish, he, 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 he has no chance to, to survive, uh, in this situation, such dreams gave him or her uh, good uh, emotions and, and some, some faith in, in the bad uh, anyway, uh, ending of, of, of its life. But for those who, Still had hope that they will, they can go out, they can escape, they can be, be released from the uh, from the camp and and uh, join with the family. After such dreams about uh, home, about families, uh, they were devastated and and they said very often that oh my god, it, it was only a dream. What a pity. Why why I'm still here. Uh, and now let's uh, go to the third uh, type of uh, therapeutic dreams, which I uh, called metaphorical dreams. In such, uh, it, it, there were dreams uh, that require interpretation by the dreamer, 
but the interpretation was given in the dream itself. The dreamer immediately grasped the meaning of his or her dream. Here is an example. Yeah? I dreamt about walking across a ruined, broken bridge over a deep, dirty, and wild river. I thought I would fall into the water, but I clung to some uh, kind of a rope hanging above me. I forced myself to gather my strength and make the final effort. In the end, I got to the other side. In the morning, I felt that the dream lifted my spirits and gave me hope of, of survival. And one uh, more example. My dream involved me falling into a deep well full of dirty water. It took me much effort. It took much effort, but I, finally I found a plank which I used to clamber out of the hole and onto the dry bed. So these dreams uh, were metaphorical, but the power of these metaphors lies in the fact that they are alive in a sense. They evoke strong emotions during the dream itself, uh, are understood yet at the same time experienced by the, experienced by the dreamer. And such dreams could be uh, found among uh, those uh, regarded by Erika Bourguignon uh, as self-evident or pre-interpreted. Erika Bourguignon is a dream researcher from the field of anthropology of dreaming. And she, uh, she wrote uh, uh, the meaning of some dreams in some contexts appear to be self-evident. In such cases, the interpretation is part of the experience and not uh, secondary elaboration. In a similar way, um, uh, about uh, metaphors in dreams, uh, uh, wrote Bert Tate. He, he was interested mainly in the rhetoric of, of dreams, of, of, of literature. And he wrote uh, in his, one of his books, uh, the meaning might be found by an analyst or interpreter, but this has nothing to do with the mode in which the image is experienced. So again, it's not the interpretation, but but uh, the, the feeling and if the interpretation is still needed in the case of metaphorical dreams, uh, the interpretation is given in the dream themselves. Them, themselves. So, so, so it doesn't require much effort to, to uh, in, interpret, to understand such dreams. Uh, in contrast to the two previous types, the metaphorical dreams involve the dreamer's activity. Rather than waiting for a carer or escaping into the world of memories and fantasies, the dreaming subject must use his or her own capacities to overcome a threat or enter a friendly space. Thus, the, dreams, uh, the dream does not so much act as a good omen, but as an opportunity allowing the dreamer to experience his or her own strength. As can be seen, uh, the operating mechanisms of therapeutic dreams in the camp were quite diverse, but those dreams always increased the inmates' self-esteem, gave them hope in survival, distracted them from the nightmarish everyday life, and allowed them to experience what they lacked the most. And above all, such dreams often proved to be the only effective help in the hell of Auschwitz. So this is important. I think that uh, the dreams uh, the, were the only phenomena that could um, help them uh, survive. Yes, and I'm absolutely convinced that um, in the investigating dreams of traumatized people uh, is, is uh, crucial to, to understand something more about the uh, psychological situation, but also the just real situation. Uh, now let's uh, come to another um, subject of my research, uh, which concerns nightmares from the post-war period. Mm, so just after the war till 1973, when the uh, questionnaires were sent out. And of course, um, adaptive nightmares may, may, may uh, sound, sound as an oxymoron. Uh, and it is true that most of the nightmares were very, very negative and devastating. Uh, the inmates, the, the respondents to the questionnaire uh, showed whole, uh, all forms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. They were uh, full of fear 
they were depressed, but often after waking up from dream, they couldn't uh, come to terms with themselves, and sometimes even some days they they felt very very bad. And uh, I, I don't uh, deny that generally the nightmares were were, were devastating, and not, nothing good could be found in them. But quite often. Uh, <clears throat> These dreams had a kind of a therapeutic uh, um, effect. Uh, let, let's read the first two examples of uh, the devastating effect of dreams. Uh, I often dreamt about being searched on the block. I feel the blows in my dreams. I feel the uh, bow lip on my back and on my head, but I pay no attention to it as I am looking for food. This is very painful, and after a dream like that, I cannot return to normal the entire day. And another one wrote, in 1970, I had a heart attack. It happened in the morning after a nightmare involving little children driven to the gas chambers. Uh, so, so okay, there is a lot of uh, testimonies like that. But many of those nightmares uh, have a therapeutic potential. They are often metaphorical. They transform the inmates' memories into something new unknown and unexpected. But um, contrary to the dreams uh, I, I was uh, talking about just a moment ago, the metaphorical dreams in the camp, uh, these dreams, the, these metaphorical nightmares were not understood by the dreams. And this is the difference. I will come back to this maybe later. Uh, but now please uh, see the, the next example. I'm in the camp, standing in the local square with people in line. I'm afraid and my fear becomes even greater as I notice that I am all alone in the yard. I run, numbed with fear. I look for my block and I stumble upon a web of corridors, a true maze. I enter a large room, bed side to side, filled with spectral people, sitting, a strange silence. Nuns, or maybe nurses, in white hats, go from bed to bed, and I start looking for my own bed. As regards those nuns and nurses, I have always wondered how they ended up in the car. And this, this man doesn't understand his dream, and uh, this dream is, of course, not literal, but metaphorical. It, it transforms the um, memories of Auschwitz with, with, with some um, extra natural and fantasy-like um, events and, and uh, devices. Uh, so, uh, to understand the potential healing um, effect of this dream, I will come back uh, again to Hartmann. Ernest Hartmann wrote, as associations are made between the terrible recent event and other material, the emotion becomes less powerful and overwhelming, and the trauma is gradually integrated into the rest of life. This is the most important Hartmann's uh, conviction about uh, the work of nightmares, right? that, that nightmares often uh, transform the bad memories, the, the, the reality, traumatic reality, into, into something new. And when they do this, this is a sign of something, something positive. Yes? Because typically, the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder nightmares, replicate the exact uh, traumatic event. They replicate it again and again. They don't change. But uh, quite often, they do change. And when they start to change, they start to change. It, it, it is a sign that something positive is, is going on in, in the dreamer's mind. And Harry Wilmer, one of many researchers who agree on this point, uh, formulated it in this way. The emergence of an ordinary nightmare after prolonged recurrent relieving of the exact trauma in dream is a healing process, and therefore I call this process the healing nightmare. Uh, it is the psychist attempt at healing. And so this is uh, what I uh, found about the potential, good potential, positive potential, in, in, even in the darkest nightmares of the inmates. And now let me uh, introduce you uh, to another uh, kind of, of nightmares after uh, Auschwitz, which are, in my opinion, absolutely uh, positive, and there should be no um, doubt, no, no discussion about the very positive uh, effects of them. Uh, these are dreams that I named comeback dreams. 
coming in, in those dreams, uh, the dreamers are coming back to the camp for the second, third, or even sixth time. One woman uh, dreamt that she, she uh, is coming back in her dreams to, to, to the camp for the sixth time. And please see this uh, example. I am in the lager for the second and sometimes even the third time, except that I know more or less how long I'm going to stay there. A month, two, three, not longer. I watch other inmates being afraid of the SS man, which is a normal thing. But for some reason, I'm not that afraid myself. Some of the SS men uh, seem to be recognizing me as an old inmate. And surprisingly enough, they smile at their old acquaintance. In, in dreams like that, uh, the main factor responsible for the therapeutic effect is the dreamer's awareness that they are in the camp for at least the second time. This knowledge gives them the possibility of looking at the traumatic memories from a certain distance. Yes, so it, it is visible also in this fragment. I dream about still being in the camp without the threat of doom or any particular torture. The camp is bearable, the war is over, it has been five years since the end, uh, but they are still keeping us because, of, because the prisoners are released in small groups and I am unlucky, so I have to wait. Uh, so, so you know that uh, things like that uh, are evidently positive because they, they understand even in, in their dreams that uh, the war is over, that something is, is, is strange, the sit their situation is better, and, and they can have a distance towards the, uh, the traumatic uh, memories. Uh, such awareness, in awareness inside the dream, uh, leads sometimes to lucidity. Yeah, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the um, notion of lucid dreams, lucid dreaming. Uh, lucid dreams are dreams in which we are uh, aware that we are dreaming. Yes, it's, uh, therefore this, this dream is lucid. For us, we, we understand that we are the dreamers. Sometimes we can, of course, have even impact on the plot of the dream, uh, but it depends, of course, of, of, of the individual um, properties of, of, of the dreamers. Uh, but it is enough when, when we just realize that we are inside our dream. Uh, the comeback dreams are not, in fact, lucid. But anyway, in such dreams, the prisoners have a kind of self-reflection as they seem to remember about their waking situation and even about the earlier uh, comeback uh, uh, nightmares. Uh, hence, uh, the therapeutic effect of comeback dreams is probably connected with the near lucid, I call it near lucid uh, character of such dreams. So there are, of course, uh, discussions about uh, the, the several levels of um, uh, metacognition in dreams, uh, in lucid dreams, and uh, um, nearly lucid, almost lucid dreams. Uh, I, if you want to read more about this, there is, of course, a very, very broad literature uh, concretely concerning the lucid dreaming, but I also recommend Tracy Cahan's uh, several articles about, about the metacognition, about self awareness in dreams, not only in lucid dreams. Uh, and now we will uh, come to another um, topic, some, something from the phenomenology of dream experience. Uh, one of uh, very interesting phenomena uh, in the camp was the ritual of dream sharing and interpreting in the camp. This is something I think really worth our um, <clears throat> attention for, for some minutes. Uh, the dream interpretation was an extremely popular and important activity in Auschwitz. The vast majority of prisoners were engaged in this activity almost every day. Every morning, we would start the day by sharing and interpreting the dreams we had during the night, one of the inmates wrote. Uh, the method of dream explanation in the camp usually was not sophisticated. Again, it was a very simple way of understanding dreams as future-oriented signs of the dreamer's fate. Uh, the inmates wanted to know if they would survive the camp, if their relatives are still alive, when the war would end, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, this is, okay, I, I would go to this. Uh, the Auschwitz Potential Dream Book, because they, of course, didn't have uh, volumes, but, but, but they just, um, talked about uh, dreams and, and some kind of potential virtual dream book existed. 
So this uh, this dream book consisted of simple ex simple explanations like the following. And you can see uh, to smoke a cigarette meant to be released from prison, to put on shoes, to be moved for interrogation or to a camp, to look into the mirror, to be interrogated, to cook meat, to be beaten during interrogation, to see keys, to go free, to wear a ring, to be chained in a bunker, to comb long hair, to be transported to a different camp, to hear a shot, a letter from home, to see lies, to receive money, to see a dead body, a trench, and et cetera, et cetera. It, it, There were, of course, much, much more uh, convictions uh, like that. So it is important that in these uh, symbols, uh, there were both good and bad meanings. Yes? Uh, therefore, uh, sometimes uh, listening to an interpretation of a dream might be um, could be um, difficult and and uh, fearful because, of course, everybody wanted to to receive a good uh, profession, uh, but they sh uh, should have uh, taken into consideration that they can uh, receive a bad um, bad, bad uh, interpreting interpretation of, of the dream. Uh, so even the method was uh, very uh, simple, not, not uh, sophisticated. Uh, sharing and interpreting dreams in Auschwitz camp was a complex and multi-level ritual, which had at least three dimensions, individual, interpersonal, and social. On the individual level, this ritual was simply the way in which the inmates could meet their needs of getting to know their future. A prisoner interpreting his or her dream or listening to a dream reader could receive a good or bad prophecy. So this is quite uh, easy. Uh, the interpersonal dimension of interpreting dreams in Auschwitz was connected with the inmates need to, for capturing others' attention. When a prisoner shared an interesting dream, he or she became, at least for a while, important for his or her interlocutor. And those who explained the dreams became important for the dreamers, of course. Uh, on this level, the meaning of a dream was not as important as the sheer fact of talking about it. Sharing dreams was therefore a kind of mutual help aimed at increasing the inmates' self-esteem. Alan Ziegel uh, he, he is also one of the most important uh, dream researchers. Uh, Ziegel admits that in psychotherapy, at times, Listening to the dream and being with the dreamer can be more important than making sense of the dream. Even today, even the situation of the current work uh, in psychotherapy, something like that is observed. So, so the more I think it was um, true in the camp. Uh, however, the most interesting level of the dream interpretation ritual was, in my opinion, the social one. First of all, talking about dreams, deliberating on their meaning and on the dreamer's future, was an excellent opportunity to find a common field of interests among the prisoners. Being emotionally engaged in dream sharing, the inmates built a community based on close relationships. One can realize to what extent dreams could be helpful here when reading to the following testimony. A dream could make someone sad, but then another would say, don't worry, in dreams that is a good sign. And then we waited to see what tomorrow has in store uh, for us. We wanted to see if it would come true. If something indeed happened, they would say, see, I told you, I told you so, uh, just as you saw in your dreams. When the dream uh, did not come true uh, for the dreamer, it came true for his friend. Dreams became common property. See, your friend dreamt about it. This is, this is fascinating, I think. The confession, this confession proves that uh, dream sharing was indeed a community building activity. When, dream, uh, when dreams become common property, it means that the community members share their most intimate experiences. It does not matter who the dreamer is and for whom a dream comes true. What matters is that they are all part of a whole and that their individual selves can resolve in a greater social substance. And for, for, for people in, in the camp, it was uh, very, very important, I think. Oh, sorry for a minute. <clears throat> that is why the inmates often had common dreams. All of us dreamt about watches that did not work, that stood uh, still. 
one of them right. And th 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 there is uh, many other uh, reports on common elements in dreams or just common dreams. And uh, in this context, uh, we could say about uh, migrating symbols. It is a term uh, coined by Jean Campbell. Jean Campbell is a researcher concentrating on the common dreams and on group dreaming. Right, uh, quite an interesting phenomenon uh, at the verge of psycho uh, parapsychology, but but still a scientific one. And Jean Campbell, uh, Campbell uh, writes. Uh, when one person in a dream group shares a dream containing a particular symbol, the next week one or two other dreamers in the group will report dreams involving the same symbol. Until sometimes, as happened in one of my recent dream groups, every dreamer in the group will be dreaming the same symbol. Hmm. Uh, we can also uh, comment on, on the com common dreams in, in, in the camp, um, uh, referring to Montagi Ullman. Uh, Montague Ullman was the inventor of one of the most prominent methods of group dream work, uh, and he claims that uh, thanks to our dreams, we can overcome bad effects of fragmentation and experience being in a wholeness, being interconnected with others. And he writes, group dream work discloses an agency that works against fragmentation, trust, communion, and a sense of solidarity develop rapidly in a dream sharing group. That is an interweaving of lives uh, to, uh, at so profound a level that the feeling of interconnectedness becomes a palpable reality. Uh, of course, today we have uh, quite a lot of researchers, dream researchers, who deal with uh, sharing dreams, with, with um, rituals, with uh, the customs of dream sharing in, in the current life. Uh, so it, it, it means that this topic is really important and, and I think it is a good idea to, to study uh, different uh, kinds of um, dream sharing in, in some uh, societies, some, some groups, etc. Um, what is also important uh, it is that many report, uh, respondents claim that they did not believe in dreams, neither before being in prison, nor after liberation from the camp. Uh, they did not pay attention to dreams in freedom and writing their testimonies, they were surprised and sometimes even ashamed that in the camp they had been so fanatically devoted to dream reading. And one of them wrote, it is hard to tell why we were all so naive. Uh, another one confesses, nowadays we see the dream readings as immature or even silly. But back then they were simply necessary. This is important that uh, people who were so so much devoted to dream sharing uh, after liberation from the camp uh, from the, from the camp uh, admit that um, we, I don't believe in dreams. D dreams are nonsense. Uh, it, there is nothing meaning in it. Yeah? Uh, I try to comment on on this phenomenon, uh, referring to Randall Collins and his uh, book, his idea of interaction ritual chain. And Colin, uh, Collins uh, thinks that uh, what people think they believe at a given moment is dependent upon the kind of interaction ritual taking place in, the, in that situation. People may sincerely feel the beliefs uh, they express at the moment they express them, especially when the conversational situation calls for a higher degree of emotional emphasis. But this, that, uh, this does not mean that they act on these beliefs or that they have a sincere feeling about them in other everyday interactions where the ritual focus is different. This is, um, I think, important not only in, in connection with dreams, but generally to understand people's uh, liability in, in their convictions, for example. Yes? It can explain, I think, the changes uh, of the respondents' beliefs about dreams. They paid enormous attention to dreams and dreaming reading, dream reading in the very specific situation of being imprisoned and humiliated but not in their uh, life in freedom. And generally, it is, it is uh, a fact, I think, that Polish people don't uh, believe in, in dreams. Polish people don't care about them. Sometimes, of course, they try to uh, explain dreams as uh, omens, yes, but, but, but the knowledge is, is uh, shallow. And they are still um, tied with the old proverb, 
uh, Fen Mara book Vyara, which I could translate, uh, the dream is dust, in God we trust. Yes. So generally it is like that, but in, in such situation like, like a concentration camp, they start to believe in dreams. Uh, so uh, yeah, I can I can say that on any level, individual, interpersonal, or social, the ritual of dream interpretation in the Auschwitz camp had great influence on the inmates. Sharing and discussing dreams was extremely helpful for them. It gave them hope. It gave them distraction from the camp reality. It increased their self-esteem. It structured their relationships with their fellow inmates. It enhanced their connectedness with other uh, member, uh, members of the Auschwitz community. However, as I uh, told you, sometimes this ritual was stressful as it uh, caused onerophobia, a fear that a dream might have turned out to be a bad omen. Uh, now let me just mention uh, some um, topics. Uh, I mean, the problems with understanding of, of dreams, yes, which, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, my respondents had, many respondents had serious problems with understanding not only the meaning, but even the source of their dreams, especially those which contained distorted images of the Auschwitz reality and presented unrealistic and metaphorical visions. In such cases, the dreamers were often confused, astonished, and helpless in their attempt to understand their dreams. Even some 30 years after the war, they were still immersed in the war past and they were still unable to comprehend it. The Holocaust, as well as their dreams, reminded for them an inexplicable mystery. I don't know if we have still time uh, to, to, to read you uh, an example of this. Maybe you can read it yourself, I don't know. I will just uh, comment on, 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 on this. Uh, what structured this man's uh, experience was not only his dream itself, but also his inability to understand it, and as a consequence, his inability to come to terms with his bad memories. This, is, uh, this was the most important truth to which uh, he bore witness in his testimony. Even uh, though this man had not tried to escape the camp in reality because he was astonished uh, that, that he still dreams about escaping from the camp, he had been escaping it endlessly in his later life, but he did not know about it. Uh, his dreams and his surprise caused by them faced him with his inner role of a permanent and unsuccessful runner from the traumatic past. Psychotherapists would try to explain those dreams in, uh, to him and help him confront his obsessive images. For us, the sole reports of the dream's manifest content and especially of the dreamer's astonishment can serve as a testimony of an Auschwitz survivor's self-confusion, a testimony not to be found among the sources of knowledge usually considered by historians. Mm -hmm. Experience, experiencing the Auschwitz and post-Auschwitz dreams as completely strange and incomprehensible phenomena could have twofold consequences for the survivors. On the one hand, we can suppose that it was a very restrictive experience, as because of being unable to find any meaning in the dreams, the former inmates could not receive any insight in their psychic state. If they had understood the dreams at last partially, if they had been familiar with any tradition or philosophy of explaining and appreciating dreams, they would have possibly took advantage of their dreams in the process of coping with the Holocaust trauma. But on the other hand, uh, the experience of being totally surprised by the dream images and emotions could perhaps allow the survivors to save their uncompromising feeling of protest against the all, all Perhaps refusing to understand their dreams meant for them a refusal to accept the Holocaust. This is also one of my uh, hypotheses about the very specific experience of not understanding sometimes so 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 obvious dreams. We could say this is obvious; it is natural that you dream about it. But he or she was uh, were astonished. Okay, I in my research I also. Um, 
was uh, involved in, in uh, the subject like dreams as literal works because some of the inmates' uh, dreams were written as, as um, literary masterpieces, poems, a fragment of epic, etc. But I will not bother you with this now. I, I uh, investigated uh, the dreams as a representation of the Holocaust. Yes. If we really can uh, treat uh, some dreams as, as uh, historical sources, and I think yes, we can. Uh, dreaming about Holocaust is is a worse uh, kind of uh, coping with the conviction of the unspeakability of the Holocaust. Yes. Maybe we can we cannot speak about the Holocaust, but we can dream about it. And when we dream, we can talk about the dreams. So the Holocaust is more um, accessible for for, for others. Yes. Uh, I wrote also about uh, Jungian big dreams, but again, I will skip it, and some in, some very general uh, conclusions, implications for the dream studies, which may be drawn from my uh, studies, uh, is uh, the, the necessity of an interdisciplinary approach to dreams and dreaming. The unique, complex, and diverse collection of the former Auschwitz inmates' testimonies can be understood and explained only when observed from many points of view at the same time. Therefore, I would like to promote the conviction that an absolute truth about dreams and dreaming does not exist, uh, that each theory is valid only in a restricted context, and that going beyond one particular method, theory of discipline should be strongly recommended in the field of dream studies. And let me uh, promote my, my book. Uh, it will be released in January, so just uh, soon by Cambridge Scholars Publishing. The title is Dreaming in Auschwitz, the Concentration Camp in the Prisoner's Dreams. And the Polish version of this book uh, has been published in 2020 by Gdańsk University Press. If you would like to, to read something more about this phenomenon, I recommend going to find finding uh, my book thank you so very much and again i am I, I would I like to express my gratitude to the uh, organizer for, for having me for for organizing this this event. thank you uh, thank you dr ovcharski uh, we can stop sharing screen yeah great and uh, yeah thank you for this fascinating material and for your thoughtful and very uh, very, very much uh, uh, interesting and scholarly interpretations of these uh, dreams. And uh, my colleague, uh, Taras Nazaruk, has this privilege to ask you first questions or comment on your presentation. But before we proceed, I take say a few words about Taras. So Taras uh, studied communication design at the University of Wroclaw, and he received degrees uh, in journalism mainly. Then he studied also uh, at Masaryk University uh, anthropology and social media and at the Center for Urban History. Uh, Taras works uh, mainly with digital projects, but not only, he is very much interested in uh, cybernetics, in uh, communication, and also in uh, new shifts that happen in epistemology and new kind of uh, uh, ways of thinking. Uh, uh, so Taras is not a Holocaust uh, researcher, nor a dream researcher, and I, I, I find your comment on interdisciplinary here very relevant, so <laughs> let him uh, communicate, please Taras. Thank you, thank you Bogdan, uh, yes indeed I actually would have a comment uh, uh, on a slightly different uh, perspective on the presentation and the, on the topic itself, and I hope this interdisciplinary interdisciplinary discussion would uh, be interesting and productive for all of us so uh so thank you professor ocharski for a very interesting and, and really so uh, provoking uh, presentation and talk and the very topic in general is uh, very much interesting uh, you you said that uh, in your research you were interested mostly in the, in the healing impact of a dreaming of a dream uh, and also, uh, you mentioned about the dreams uh, during the during the 
period of being at the concentration camp, but also post concentration camp uh, experiences of dreaming and interpretation, the very rituals uh, of dream sharing during uh, being in the camp and this phenomenology of dream experiences is extremely interesting. Uh, but the very topic itself and the, in your presentation, the examples that you uh, shared with us uh, and those quotations also made me thinking of a dream as a as a source and evidence and and this is something that you also mentioned in one of your last slides and maybe uh, this uh, q a session and discussion could be an opportunity to elaborate on that more but uh, i was also thinking uh, uh what can we learn about past while reading dreams and how can we actually read it so how can we consider dreaming uh, or dream dream sharing dream telling uh a source and evidence, historical evidence, uh, in this case about the Holocaust, but also in general about historical events. And, uh, and, and your presentation shows how, how those dreams are actually uh, a, a real opportunity to, to have at least a glimpse into experiences that are uh, unspeakable or unspoken as uh, as as you um, also uh, also describe it so the experiences that are unspeakable and experiences that uh, for instance the experiences of the holocaust it is impossible to understand this experience for those who did not personally went through it so this is something for us that we cannot comprehend in uh, fully uh, as well as any other uh, historical event uh, that we didn't experience by ourselves so ex dreaming or dreams about that uh, dreams for for those who experience that is uh, kind of a uh, key to at least try to understand it and uh, uh, and also this is an opportunity to see the dreams uh, as something that is very emotional even intimate because expressions uh, of such experience, this is something that that's not everyone uh, would be willing to share, and something that uh, very uh, uh, is an opportunity to uh, to get to uh, really deep emotional feelings and uh, and get closer to to one's experiences through the, re the through the reading of uh, one's uh, dreams. Uh, but at the same time, we are not able actually to get there uh, to the to the genuine essence of someone someone's dream because we cannot see uh, dreams of others we can only uh, basically learn about representations of those dreams we can only learn of uh, of how this uh, experience of dreaming was afterward represented in a spoken word in a ritual of uh, dream sharing uh, uh, interpersonally or in a group and so on so we can basically uh, can comprehend only a translation of a dream into a spoken word not the very dream itself which means that there is something lost in this translation because uh, like the dreaming la language, if I can use this term, dreaming language or dreaming experience is a, something different than a spoken verbalized language and, this, uh, and the dream that is verbalized in a text. Uh, so verbal language in general is also very limited in that sense and cannot equally, uh, cannot equally express uh, what was experienced uh, during uh, the dream. So we have this gap uh, in that sense. And this is a kind of a paradox in a communicative sense, because dreaming is not an opportunity. Uh, dreaming is actually is an opportunity to get closer to the core of one's experience, to get really deep into someone's emotions and feelings, especially when it comes to uh, dramatic historical events. Uh, but we do not have any practical means to see the dream itself. Uh, because of our limitations, we are simply humans, so we can only we can only read representations of dreams. We can only read those rep representations in a form of words or in form of text, for instance. And this is something I found very intriguing and thrilling, even because uh, it raises a lot of questions: how to deal with this obstacle in a communication sense, how to deal with this obstacle which complicates our understanding of someone's dream. 
and how can we still learn from uh, such a source as a dream given those limitations given those obstacles at the same time how to still acknowledge the value of the representation because the representation itself has a, also a great importance and the practice of sharing those as you uh, also presented in your talk uh, the practice of uh, sharing uh, the dreams and those uh, representations of those dreams are, are also very important so uh, uh, from, I think it is uh, something uh, very um, I mean in that paradox is very there is there's something uh, very intriguing and from that perspective I wanted to ask you professor Ocharsky what do you think of uh, of actually um, various forms of other forms of representation of dreams if it's not textual for instance if there is an option of non-verbal representation of dreams for instance uh, i mean the last event at the center about dreams that we had uh, elaborated more on film sequences and how uh, film as a means as a medium a means of communication is used to represent dreams and it was not about verbal form it was a visual form so are there visual forms of dream representation in general are you familiar with this kind of uh, documents uh, when it comes to the holocaust or some other historical events uh, and uh, are there any visual sources about dreams during the holocaust as well uh, but I'm also curious not only in visual uh, representations of dreaming or dreams, but also in uh, in the spatial aspect. Uh, uh, Bodan mentioned our digital projects at the center, and uh, uh, for instance, in Live Interactive, in in the project that I'm working uh, on, uh, uh, which is the digital encyclopedia about the history of Lviv, and we also pre prepare different kind of uh, publications about the the holocaust the history of the holocaust in the city as well so for instance uh, in in this our projects we try to present uh, certain historical narratives using a spatial perspective to map the route of certain event or describe places where the event took place uh, i mean it was happening uh, because giving the context of actual place and often it makes the story less abstract, uh, more comprehensible through the those spatial associations with actual places where it happened or, or, or might happen. So I'm curious uh, whether um, this kind of spatial perspective could be a representation of a dream. Are there any dreams documented through map, for instance? Uh, or uh, some verbally described dreams at first place, but then uh, maybe they could be mapped through the map or put on the map. Is this method, uh, in your opinion, could uh, could help us in learning something new about one's experience, uh, considering uh, um, dream uh, as a source? Uh, and I would also uh, like to ask you about, uh, because you mentioned this uh, classification, especially when you were talking about therapeutic effects, the healing impact of a dreaming. Uh, uh, you mentioned about your uh, categories, uh, caring dreams, freedom dreams, and uh, metaphorical dreams. And uh, mm, I... Uh, uh, I've read uh, some article by um, Barbara Engel King, uh, Engel King about dream as a source to study Holocaust, uh, which is also um, very much relevant to the to the topic of, of today's events. And uh, 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 she was uh, focusing more on the uh, on the documents that she was able to find at Yad Vashem and the uh, Zhdovsky Institute uh uh, so dreams uh, mostly from Warsaw, Lviv, and other cities uh, in uh, in um, in the occupied Poland uh, during the occupation, during the ghetto, but not during in the concentration camp. So it's a bit different types of sources uh, than uh, in your research. But at the same time, they also she also uh, made a kind of a classification, categorization of dreams that uh, she finds uh, in. Uh, uh, in her uh, in her research, and she she made this categorization according to functions. Uh, basically, uh, how this dream functioned in the person's experience, and she she like 
the good classification goes like this that there is uh, mostly there are uh, um, dreams that function as the expression of certain emotion so basically they tell uh, a lot about uh, emotional Im feelings impressions of certain uh, individual uh, uh, the other function of a dream could be a stimulative, mobilizing uh, function, something that mobilizes you, stimulate, and you mentioned about that as well in some of the cases that it helped people to uh, to survive, to to go through the experience of concentration camp. Uh, so uh, there was a kind of uh, uh, mobilizing fi function as well, and uh, and the other. Uh, category or function that she mentioned is a uh, warning kind of warning dreams as uh, neo uh, kind of uh, dreams that are prognostic uh, uh, that are looking into into the future that they try to prognose what will happen but at the same time they function as something that you that warns you uh, to i don't know to to react to something to be aware of something to wait for something to happen uh, so I've, I'm just curious, uh, uh, how would you find this categorization? Does it fit to uh, to your uh, sources? Uh, would you find uh, it relevant uh, uh, when it comes to the classification that also you did? Um, it would be interesting to hear your, uh, uh, your opinion about that. And I also wanted to ask you about... Uh, uh, the other part of your presentation about the phenomenology of dream experience and I find it really interesting uh, that you mentioned about the practice of dream sharing and dream interpretation uh, as a kind of collective social group practice it's, it is really interesting to learn about that and I'm actually being kind of ignorant in that I, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious uh, to learn uh, uh, is it something also uh, culturally enabled? Is it something that we can find as a common practice across different cultures and times? Is it something very relevant to very specific situation of risk, emergency, or uh, danger? Or maybe uh, we can find this in the various cultural traditions. You mentioned that, for instance, in Polish uh, cultural tradition, this is not that much uh, present. So how would you uh, uh, see it in a kind of a long durée perspective and uh, from a cultural tradition perspective? Is it something that uh, uh, could be explained also in other contexts, not only, uh, I mean, the practice of dream sharing, dream telling, uh, not only in the context of being present in the concentration camp, but also in other situations of, uh, and circumstances. So uh, probably this would be uh, my comment and questions. Uh, for now and uh, yeah probably i stop here so thank you again for this uh, very impressive uh, research and and the presentation <clears throat> thank you okay, okay. Uh, bogdan please uh, only tell me if, if i should answer right now or or, or uh, at the end because i'm not i don't know how, what, what's what the order is, but but anyway, thank you, Taras, for, for very interesting comments and questions, very inspiring to, 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 um, thinking about those phenomena. I'm here, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm at the university and uh, the connection was lost, so I, I almost heard all the questions uh, by Taras, uh, but I disappeared several times, sorry. So yes, now uh, we proceed in a way that you uh, respond to comments uh, on, on what Taras uh, was asking, and then we open the floor for other participants, Q&A session. Okay, so uh, I try to uh, follow the, the questions in the, in the uh, order they were asked. Uh, you asked about dreams as evidence uh, of uh, reality. Yes, it, it, it is. It is indeed an important uh, question if uh, dreams can be um, treated as uh, real testimonies. Yes, for, for historians, for, for example, it depends. I think there are many historians who will answer no. Absolutely, it is impossible. Dreams are just just fantasy. Uh, but on the other hand, um, people more open to, to interdisciplinary studies uh, can can say something different. That um, uh, at the end, we, we only we always uh, 
deal with some uh, images. Yes, we we uh, we uh, every every kind of, um, of of testimony is is just somebody's um, feelings, somebody's opinions, somebody's memories. And so we can never be sure that what somebody says about a real fact is indeed more real than when he or she is, is, is talking about uh, genes. Yes. Yeah? Uh, and and uh, if the his story described in the dream is is less real and is less serious than stories or comments or emotions expressed in connection with the so-called reality, so so the the border is is blurred I think and and um, it is possible I think it is possible to to treat dreams as as some kind of testimonies of course with, with the distance with with, with, with uh, caution and and it depends on the researchers. Uh, talent um, and, and it, this is at the end the most important factor which can quali qualify a dream report as, as a testimony or, or not. There is no an, an general answer uh, valid in, every, in, in each situation, I think. It is connected with what you said about uh, the possibility to reach the essence of someone's uh, dream. Yes. Of course, it is a very uh, known uh, problem in dream studies. Even Freud was aware about it, and in his in the interpretation of dreams, uh, Freud wrote that we will never uh, have an access to somebody's dreams. We will only uh, deal with description. Yes. Uh, Freud was uh, tricky because uh, he um, even uh, told that when uh, somebody uh, after waking up, returns or uh, reminds his or her dream. It is uh, uh, it's, it's still it is still dream work. Yes, that, that our our um, narration about, narrated about a dream uh, is is distorted in the same uh, way as as the dream images themselves are distorted because of the dream work. Yes? So this is, this is a paradoxical answer of Freud. But of course, not only Freud was concerned with this. Many researchers uh, discuss today this problem. Uh, for example, uh, Hall, um, um, Calvin Hall, a uh, very important American uh, researcher on the um, content of, of dreams and the quantitative uh, analysis of dreams, uh, his definition of dreams is the following. Dream is uh, something which somebody will tell us when we uh, ask him about his dream. <laughs> so, so, so it is, of course, it is humorous, but, but uh, Hall was convinced that um, there is no um, uh, possibility to, to, to uh, come to the essence, but it's okay. We, we should uh, treat the narrative as a dream and, and it uh, changed nothing. Maybe, maybe something could change, but not, not so much that we could not uh, interpret it. Uh, it is also said that uh, we don't have to, uh, the access to our own dreams because when we wake up, we can we have access only to our memories, which are distorted quite often, to our retelling of these dreams. So so generally, it is it's possible to to have uh, the the core uh, the, the the pure essence of the dream, somebody's eyes or our own. It's a pity, but I, I think from the practical from the practical point point of view. Uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't care about it yes we we, we can't we can't change it we can't uh, find the dream of course i know that some uh, neurologists are trying to keep some some electrodes to our brain or, or, or the enemy uh, testing and, and they they want to record our dreams but it is uh, still so so undeveloped method that we can't uh, rely on it it is like that. We, we can only narrate it. But uh, as I said, we, we also have narratives, only narratives about any kind of uh, events, stories, memories from the past, not only the memories of, of our dreams. And therefore, I think we should uh, interpret the report anyway. Uh, let me uh, see. Mm. Ah, Non-verbal uh, representations of them. This is very interesting. I'm not I'm not much familiar with, with this, uh, but of course I've heard about some artistic uh, attempts to um, maybe not describe, but but uh, record dreams as yes, in 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 uh, uh, film, in in uh, vid uh, video installations, uh, in maybe music also yes. 
Uh, I, I will not give you examples of uh, such practices concerning the very traumatized people uh, or, or the victims of genocide, unfortunately. I don't know if any uh, Auschwitz uh, survivors uh, recording this in that way. I don't know if any other victims of any other atrocities. Uh, but I suppose they can exist. Uh, I only know about uh, uh, some attempts of, of artists who uh, collected dreams during the pandemic in Poland, and they uh, produced a theater performance based on those dreams, uh, and they tried to translate the dream description into a dance, in, into some, some video installations. Uh, but this is rather ephemeral, not, 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 not very often uh, from mine, uh, as far as I know. Yes, but but as, I, as I told you, I am not an expert in this, so, so, so I'm sure you have more examples to, to share it with us than, than I can have. Uh, I appreciate, I appreciate absolutely these kinds of uh, recording dreams, because as I said, we, we cannot grasp the essence of a dream in, in the language. Yes? So we can try to, to, to touch some, some kind of essence in, in other languages, like, like uh, dance, like music, like uh, film. Why not? It is, it is a very, very positive uh, attempt to um, have the access to, to dreams from the other side. So I, I'm absolutely open and, and I would recommend everybody to, to experiment on, on um, dream recording like that. Mm. Oh, for example, for example, yes, I know. Uh, Mark Balagrov, Mark Blagrov, a very uh, known um, English uh, dream researcher, uh, who deals with dream sharing, with, with, with traumatic dreams, etc. He's a psychologist, mm -hmm. but he, his partner, I don't remember her name now, sorry, uh, but they decided to work together. And uh, they use the Montag Ullman's method of dream uh, sharing. They, they introduce, uh, they invite some people uh, to, to, to make a small uh, dream group, and uh, somebody of the people uh, tells his or her dream. Mark is trying to maybe not interpret, but, but to work with the group in, in, uh, in order to understand from, uh, something from the dream. And at the same time, his partner draws these dreams on the pages of Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams. Yes, and it is kind of a performance, uh, but uh, they say that the drawings are not no less important and no, no less meaningful than the explana explanations, interpretations. So, so yes, I, I know of this, this uh, uh, example and I, I find it very interesting. I didn't uh, participated participated in participated myself yet, but I hope to uh, sometime uh, join such a, such a group and and experience it on my own uh, body how it works. Yes, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Barbara Engelking, yes, of course, her, her article of uh, dreams as uh, testimonies of Holocaust is very important, very interesting, as you said. Uh, she deals only with dreams from the ghetto and from the so-called Aryan side, those of those who, those Jews who hide in the Aryan side. But he, she she uh, don't uh, doesn't have access to dreams from the camp. Uh, my uh, examples are from the camp, but as I told at, at the beginning, um, I don't know how many of them are, are Jewish uh, people. Maybe maybe very very small. A number. So, so this is a difference because Engel King is generally interested in Jewish people. Dreams. She, she is convinced that the Jewish experience of the uh, of the warrior was completely different from from any other nations. Yes, of course I understand this, and uh, and it, the, the arguments are very um, compelling. Uh, but 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 we worked on on different material. And yes, of course, I, I agree that uh, the um, classification and, and, and the, the examples of, of uh, several uh, kinds of, of dreams she, she found uh, could be also found in, in the in, in Auschwitz inmates uh, reports. Uh, because, uh, you know, we, we can always cl classify things in, in different ways and, and, and she is convincing in it. Maybe a uh, um, limitation of her study is that uh, she, as far as I remember, but she was not so interested in the people's um, attitudes towards these dreams, about people's uh, beliefs about dreams. Yes? 
And I think it should be it should be also interesting not um, just to, to ask them about the dreams and, and I know she doesn't ask real people she she, she found found uh, the, their um, descriptions, but it, it would be interesting to go deeper into some. Um, Evidences, some, some some testimonies uh, revealing how the, the, those people treated their own dreams. If they believed, if they paid attention to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is uh, connected with your probably last question about dream sharing and cultural differences. Yes, uh, of course, of course, it is very important to uh, study dream sharing in the context of, of, of the cultural issues. There are different uh, attitudes to dreams in different cultures, and it is impossible to um, <clears throat> forget about it in in, in uh, such research. So when I wrote uh, the chapter about interpreting dreams in Auschwitz, I first uh, delineated uh, very very shortly the cultural uh, traditions of Polish people and Jewish people, yes? and the differences is is huge. Yes? As I thought, Polish people didn't care about uh, dreams. Uh, while the Jewish people uh, were and are still much more uh, devoted to dream interpretation, the, the, the tradition in Talmud, in, in the old times, in the religion, uh, are, are uh, uh, also um, deep and, and connected with, with those uh, rituals of dream interpretation. But on the other hand, uh, one of my theses was that um, in the camp, uh, when the reality was absolutely different from anything that people remembered from the past, when the social structure, the social relationships were different and not, uh, not similar to those from the real life, I had the impression that the cultural influences, of course, they were and they must have been, yes, but, but at the same point, the cultural influences were not so important and not, not as important as the new uh, social um, structure of, of, of living in, in the very specific reality of the camp. Uh, so uh, I was not so much interested in, for example, the Jewish tradition of dream interpretation, but of, of the very current situation in, in the camp at, at the time they were there. And, and uh, because of this, it was so um, interesting for me that the same people didn't care about dreams before the uh, imprisonment, after imprisonment, uh, but inside the camp, the attitudes were quite uh, different. So, so, so it, it, for me, it was not so much um, influenced by the culture, but by the very um, specific situation, social situation inside the camp. But you are absolutely right that we should uh, connect our uh, research on dream sharing with, with the cultural background, with the cultural tradition in which uh, some societies are, are um, immersed. I don't know if I answered your question. Maybe something uh, I, I omitted. So can you please, please remind me about something? If, if, if I thank did. you very much. Yeah, thank you for your answers. I, I, I am grateful to you. Thank you for the very inspiring um, any questions. Uh, thank you both, Taras and Professor Ovchalski, and uh, uh, some pe people are leaving. Uh, we have. Uh, um, we have a lot of Ukrainians who are joining from various places, so we don't know what is the technical situation, though. Uh, we have the opportunity uh, to ask direct question from Professor Obcharsky. So if you want to ask a question, please go to the lower bar of uh, Zoom and select the reactions uh, button, then just raise your hand and then we will uh, invite you to a discussion. Uh, meanwhile, I uh, I just want to reflect on uh, on what you said in your presentation, your talk, your interpretation. I was really struck by this these dreams that uh, refuse to accept the Holocaust. For me, it really kind of probably it was connected to my talk before your presentation. I've been talking with my friend, and we were kind of you know exchanging thoughts about. How it is possible that strong big cultures produce such great uh, uh, disastrous events like you know Germans or Russians or whatever. And I, I, I said that for me it's still difficult to accept 
this that you know people produce big culture and then they are kind of uh, uh, terrorizing uh, artists and then that my friend said that I I still can't accept Holocaust and it's like for me it was really kind of what you said that it can come in dream but for many people probably for many I heard from some people that they still have problem with even in a cognitive state of mind to accept what what has happened in the past and also another comment it's not a question but a comment uh, today my i have an informant in st petersburg in russia and she sent me a project which collects dreams in russia and it's very similar to what we do at the centers like collecting dreams since february 24 and what was really striking again uh, in comparison to, to your material, uh, Russian dreams that I see there, they are full of water and droning and horrible images. While images that we collect, like images, dreams that we collect, they are not that horrible. They are often about homes, coming home, trying to get out. And this is interesting. I, I don't know who will maybe analyze in the future uh, how Russians or Ukrainians dreamt this war, uh, but I find uh, your material very relevant to what they dream. Probably, you know, some simple interpretation interpretations come to my mind, but I don't want to <laughs> just express them. We have a question from Billy Glue. Billy is our colleague from the UK, and he made the first presentation in this cycle of events about the dream sequences in film culture. So, Billy, please, the floor is yours. Hiya. Um, hello there. Yeah, thanks for your talks. Very interesting. Uh, very interesting to hear Taras's questions too. I just wanted to just can you you can hear me okay? Yeah. I just wanted to say a couple of points that you made me think of, and then I got a question at the end if that's okay. So I just wanted to sort of also when Taras was asking his questions, it made me think also. I think there's definitely this point that. Sometimes uh, when somebody explains like a dream and then it can be seen as like the, it can be like um, criticized or said that the testimony has some sort of less credibility because it's not, because obviously someone's recounting a dream and there's some sort of like missing time there from waking up and then they're recounting. So it's kind of a mixture of a memory and a recounting of a dream as well. But I do think it's worth bearing in mind that when people recount what they've done when they're awake, that's still information is still censored uh, by the speaker, by the person recounting it, because the person recounting it might purposefully withhold some details or they might unconsciously withhold details or they might have forgot some details or they might remember the information differently to how it happened. So I think that it's important to bear that in mind and it's and it. And uh, I think uh, information from somebody recounting something that happened when they were awake can easily be as, it, it can also be discredited in, in many ways um, too. So it, it doesn't have to be a hierarchy that waking information is more reliable, that, you know, it might be less reliable sometimes. It can go either way, I think. Um, I wanted to comment on the point where you said about the dream sharing, because um and, and, it, and it ties in with your point about the dream theories. I, I also, I spent a lot of years studying dream sequences in film, and I came to the conclusion that no one dream theory is accurate completely. And what usually happens is that whoever devises a theory, part of the point of devising their theory is to discredit the other theories so that their theory feels like the correct one, so that they have like the highest reputation. But if you can take a step back, Actually, what I found that for me, the most meaning comes from combining aspects from the different theories to come up with an overall understanding. Uh, and different dreams can be more usefully interpreted using different theories, depending on the dream, perhaps. I think that's so I think that's a point. So I wanted to give an example, actually, um, because in my thesis, one of the people I wrote about was somebody called Antti Rivonsuo, who is a Finnish uh, dream theorist. And uh, his idea is that all dreams are threat simulations. So it ties in very tightly with um, your talk today uh, because um, people are obviously dreaming about things that we could say were threats that they were experiencing and uh, how they might survive those threats by escaping or something like that. 
But within so in that way, Ravon Suo's work ties in tightly with some of the things you've said. But at the same time, he, he openly discredits this idea of sharing dreams. And he says that any sort of ideas of sharing dreams for personal cultural purposes is uh, doubtful as any sort of useful aspect of dreaming. He says, but, but you know, like in my thesis, I put, well, we can't know that. Perhaps people who share dreams gain some special knowledge that meant they had a better chance to survive. So perhaps sharing dreams enhance the chances for people to survive. You know, it's um, it, the, these things can go either way. So it's interesting how the different theories, like some elements are very, yeah, so it, it's how the different dream theories contradict one another. And if we take a, all of what Renvon Sua said as accurate, you know it might not be so good it's better to take parts from the different theories so it's just something what i wanted to reflect anyway um one of the examples that you gave of dreams from the people from the uh, this is leading to my question by the way but one of the examples you gave of the dreams was the dream where you said somebody said they dreamt about walking across a narrow river filled with murky water across the river and then they carried this fish and you, this is a dream what you said to me right so it immediately made me think of a dream in one of carl jung's books so while you were speaking, I found the dream, all right, because I wanted to make sure I could find the right one. So it's uh, in, in one of his books. Um, let me just, I'll find the title of the book in a moment. But he recounts a dream where a woman says she's about to cross a wide river. There is no bridge, but she finds a ford where she can find a place to cross. She's on the point of doing so when a large crab that lay hidden in the water seizes by the foot and won't let her go. So I thought that this dream, it sounds very similar. There's some real similar aspects to the dream what you said. And I just think that this idea, uh, many of the dreams that you spoke about today had water as a key theory, a uh, key element, sorry, and also murky water. It was a big part of uh, the dreams that you, you mentioned. And Carl Jung particularly mentioned water as an important archetypal aspect of dreaming. And I just wondered, so my question is, I wondered, I wondered if you found whether it's through Carl Jung or whichever theorist, but I've just wondered if you found what key sort of recurring um, aspects you found in the dreams. We can see just from your examples that water, rivers, crossing rivers, this as aspect is a key element in, men in the dreams that you've used as examples. Uh, you mentioned a couple of religious figures also. But were there other symbol? Were there other fi figures that occurred in dreams uh, many times? For example, could be mathematical shapes or animals or types of people, some kind of symbols. I'm just interested uh, what which things rent uh, often occurred, uh, either in the during the Auschwitz dreams or when the people came out afterwards. That's my question. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Billy. Uh, yeah. Please watch it. Thank you very, thank you very much for very interesting uh, comments and, and the question about the dreams of water. Uh, <clears throat> of course, I agree that uh, we we have a lot of very interesting theories and we can and should uh, take advantage of them, but but not to be absolutely devoted to any of them. I very much like uh, anti revanceros theory, both of the threat simulation of dreams and later of social simulation. In, in dreams, uh, they work together with my colleague from Finland, Katia Valley, and and I am quite familiar with this. And, and of course, uh, I am not sure if, if they are absolutely right about this conviction that dreams are always a threat simulation. But I I am quite convinced that sometimes, maybe even quite often, dreams uh, have this 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 function, yes, to to try to learn us something uh, when we are sleeping. Uh, similar with, with Jung, I, I love Carl Jung. I, I, I absolutely uh, appreciate his his, uh, his psychology, his philosophy, and also his dream theories. Uh, although he was not consistent, and he, he had a lot of concepts mutually, um, how to say, um, contradicted for some something like that. Sorry for my, sorry for my English. Uh, and um, I, I even uh, wrote one one uh, chapter of my book uh, devoted to 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 uh, uh, refugee, no uh, um, inmates' dreams, uh, so-called big dreams in Jungian terms, uh, interpreted in, in Jungian uh, terms. Uh, and I agree that in the, those dreams about crossing water, uh, this is an archetypal situation. We can interpret them in in, in Jungian terms. Yes. 
uh, so uh, absolutely there are a lot of dreams not only in the minds of, of the victims or, or the survivors but uh, only also in, in normal people that these are uh, believed to be dreams about initiation about a change in life yes about being faced with with a possible change with a necessity of a change etc etc uh, but uh, in, in in this these dreams that I described, I was rather concerned on how those dreams uh, affected the dreamers. Yes, and it was certain for me that uh, most of them, most of the inmates, were not familiar with Jung, yes, with, with uh, other other um, dream researchers, and and I, I wouldn't like to. Uh, try to interpret it from from my point of view, from Jungian point of view, but but just was interested in, in the mechanism in which the dreams uh, worked for those people. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure if I, I absolutely grasped your question uh, at, at the very end of your of your uh, talk. You you asked me about the possible similarities between the dreams of, of the. Well, yeah, I was just saying, is it like, for example, so if it, if we just take. For now, say that water is a common thing that cropped up in several of the dreams that you've uh, researched. I wondered if there was other sort of themes that cropped up regularly in the dreams, like the, not water, but some other things that were like several people spoke about a similar kind of experience in the dream. That's that's what I was asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, I agree. There, there, there are I know a lot of uh, examples very similar, and this is a kind of a common dream imagery. And and uh, but I, what I generally think about it, I, I believe in a common uh, unconscious. I believe in the common archetypes. But I also uh, like to to go uh, in 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 line uh, with, with with a person, with an individual who is dreaming. So I'm reluctant to uh, have a general answers that uh, dreams about crossing a river always mean that uh, somebody will have to, to change something. Yes? It is this is quite common, but it is always uh, different in in every particular situation. So, so so it's not enough just to understand the uh, universal dream symbols. Yes, but 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 I, I would recommend always to try to uh, go into details with, with, with the dreaming person. It's somewhat in a Freudian uh, way to, to ask about associations about uh, to ask about the particular life situation of the dreamer. And and then we can uh, know <clears throat> better the, the meaning, the potential dream, the dream. But of course, I agree that there are dreams like like that which are common, which are very often, and which which can be more or less pre-interpreted in, in that way. Uh, Jung suggested it's fascinating. Thank you, Professor Obcharski. So please, if there are other questions, you can raise your hand. Uh, if not, we are going then to close this session. It's already almost two hours, a bit less. I would only <laughs> ask you, Bogdan, about the Russian dreams. Uh, do you know uh, what what uh, what people, what kind of people from from what region, from what uh, social social uh, structure these these dreams were uh, collected? I will uh, I will uh, let me find it. Sorry. I will now send the link in, okay. into our common chat. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, we have a chat. So uh, anyone can che check this. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this is kind of project that I found interesting. But when I said about water, uh, this my informant, uh, since I've been asking her about the Russian dreams since March, and she was also sharing this among her friends, and uh, uh, there was uh, several. There were several people who sent me these dreams through Telegram. Uh, just you know, they introduced themselves and said, "It's like uh, Olga told us that you are collecting dreams, and we are willing to share." And uh, I found fascinating that there was a lot of water actually in, the, in these yes, dreams. It's very interesting. <laughs> yes. In general, the Russian dreams in this situation. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, yeah, apparently that, you know, now in Ukraine, we it's very difficult to discuss, to discuss any kind of uh, uh, Russian cases, but still uh, 
we may think, we may think, I don't know, but we may think that they also live in a kind of distant, complicated situation. Of course, they are not living through the war like we do, but probably they anticipate something. So here, I, I uh, this is what I also had in mind. This is not a question, but uh, uh, reading uh, Charlotte Berat's book, Reinhard Kozelek was really uh, impressed that uh, these dreams were recorded uh, before the war started. So for him, it was kind of a great sign that basically these dreamers could anticipate a terror mm -hmm. that will take place in the future. So this made him think that such things as dreams, they have kind of this double nature that uh, they are, uh, as Taras asked, they are evidences, historical evidences, but then on the other side, they are directed into the future. So if you can say that uh, people guessed that something will happen, then Kozalek would argue that we are dealing with specific temporality. This is not the, the kind of fixed temporality. Dreams uh, show us uh, a really com complexity of time and, and perception of time. And uh, because of this, he even uh, proposed to kind of uh, introduce dreams as very important sources for histor historians, because he was an academic historian. Yeah. And, and uh, I also wondered whether your materials show that people I understand that they were sharing dreams and they were guessing whose dream worked uh, in guessing the future, yes? Mm -hmm. But was it, re was it really something that they would say, yeah, my dreams were kind of uh, uh, about the future? Uh, yes, of course. <clears throat> of course, there were <clears throat> some such dreams and such, such beliefs yes, that believe that they can uh, learn about the future. And sometimes it was a, a few... Uh, examples of dreams in which they uh, said that uh, they um, predicted, for example, Auschwitz, that after after even hearing about uh, Auschwitz, uh, they dreamt uh, such situation which later in Auschwitz uh, was absolutely the same, yes, and you, 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 of course we, we can uh, doubt if it is reliable, I, I will not judge it, but, but there were some uh, testimonies of people who said that they um, were able to, to um, have prophetic dreams about the war atrocities before the war uh, started. So, so, but, but anyway, the Charlotte Bernard's book is absolutely um, fascinating. In my opinion, it is, it is a, one of the best books written about dreams ever. Yes, it, it is something, something absolutely uh, phenomenal. And, and um, Yes, but, but but as you said, it was from the uh, 30s in, in the Germany, 33, 39, before the war, but after Hitler came to power and, and about the situation in the, the Third Reich. I, I can recommend to everybody to read to read this book. And we do recommend to read uh, Professor Ovcharsky articles and the future book in English, or if you are familiar with Polish, please read in Polish. We are really grateful for your I work in this field. Uh, it's very enlightening for us. Uh, we are mainly academic historians who are not until recent uh, dealt with dreams. <laughs> and we uh, encountered uh, this uh, fascinating source, uh, which is very helpful for historians as well. And uh, indeed, mm -hmm. dreams, uh, at least in my case, uh, they, they work therapeutically. I agree. So, uh, oh, oh. Most of your interpretations I find very uh, sort of useful and academically uh, fascinating. Uh, so uh, I am uh, going to close this session. We have almost two hours now since we started. And uh, I am very thankful yeah, to Magdalena Zolkos for, for making us, uh, to bringing us into close contact with the Center for Urban History. And we, we really hope that uh, Professor Obcharsky will have the opportunity to visit us in Lviv uh, and uh, we will have <laughs> a live session. You are also welcome to Gdańsk. Please visit Gdańsk, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful uh, place in Poland. 
We know from many recollections of Ukrainian migrants, uh, I think it's a huge community of Ukrainians now living in Dines. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, most of them send these images of sea and uh, so fascinating with, with your beautiful city. And we are very it's busy. Yeah, we are also very thankful to Poles who help all those thousands, almost more than one million people. You know? uh, uh, so it's a great help, and uh, indeed, uh, without you, probably we would lose this war uh, already. So thank you. I, I am grateful to you, and and I, I admire your your uh, strength and bravery uh, in front of this stupid, crazy war. And I, I wish you all the best, and and fuck Putin and and all the. Um, <laughs> bastards i'm sorry for my language but at the end of this meeting i can admit uh, afford so so thank you very much for having me again and and i i, I wish wish you to, to end this this war very soon and come back to the normal life and i hope we will have a lot of possibilities to, to meet both in ukraine and, and, and in poland thank you professor Obcharski, and thank you all for coming thank to this meeting Bye. And uh, yeah, for being with us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Also, oh.